Good evening, everyone. I'm David McGowan. I'm the CEO here at WJCT Public Media, and I am just delighted to see such a full house tonight and have all of you here with us. It's really a treat. Ira Flato is a television host and a producer, an author, and what can only be described as a phenomenon on public radio. I hope, hope that's a good thing. He is best known as the host of Science Friday, a role which he has played for more than 30 years now. He's won numerous awards and honorary degrees for his role in science education and understanding. So please join me in giving a hearty welcome to Jacksonville, to Ira Flato. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. David and I actually go way back. I used to work with his father. That's how old I am. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> so before we get going this evening, uh, just a few uh, housekeeping announcements. I first want to say thank you, a special thank you, to our sponsors for, for this evening, the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations and Med Evidence. Really appreciate their support. And I also want to say a special, really heartfelt thank you to our First Coast Society members who are here this evening and to those who aren't here. That group of generous supporters makes so much possible here. And we really appreciate your generosity and in helping to make this event happen tonight. So any of you who are interested in joining who aren't already members, you'll find some material on your table. Don't be bashful. They don't strike me as a bashful group. No, I don't think so. I've talked to almost everybody in this room tonight. <laughs> I didn't find one bashful person. <laughs> We're also, we are going to um, get to some questions tonight from the audience. Ira and I will chat for a while, and then we will take questions. Um, so please, when that time comes, please look for some of my colleagues in the audience who will have microphones um, and try to flag them down, and, uh, and, and we'll get to that point in a little while. But Ira, let's start where it all began. You grew up in New York. You developed a science, uh, an interest in science early. Yeah. Where did that interest come from? You know, I don't know where it came from, but I do know how it got to snowball. I mean, I was, kids are always, I think of them as natural scientists. They're curious about everything. They get into trouble. They want to see how things work. They take stuff apart. When I was a kid, it was, you know, gee, there's a VCR. Maybe a Pop-Tart fits right in that slot, you know? <laughs> and and people, kids are experimenting with it. And I had, a, uh, I had an eighth grade teacher, Mrs. Pfeffer, real name, you know? And she had a science club after school, and she encouraged me and other kids to come stay after school and do these experiments in science and I kept my interest going then. Because what happens with kids is that even though they start out as scientists, something gets in the way, adolescence gets in the way. And if you talk to scientists about what made them successful or why they continued, a lot of them will tell you that they had a mentor. <clears throat> Some people, it could be Mrs. Pfeffer, or a science teacher. Some people, it could be their parents. But someone who kept them on the road of keeping, uh, staying interested in science and continuing to uh, follow their interest in being curious, because it's all about curiosity. So you trained as an engineer at the State University of New York at Buffalo, but... <laughs> no wonder you're down here. I can see that. <laughs> but in addition to the science bug, you seem to develop the media bug um, pretty quick. You became a reporter at the radio station in Buffalo, uh, the news director there, before becoming a science correspondent for NPR. Did you right. like talking about science more than you like doing it? I was terrible at engineering student. I was a terrible engineering student. I knew that I wasn't going to make it there, although I, I did graduate and wanted to get my degree in industrial engineering. And my girlfriend at the time in college said, you're awful, you're unhappy. If you don't do something, we're done. Basically, <laughs> now I had done some. I had done some theater in high school, so I wasn't afraid to be in front of a microphone or, or the public. And I had done some television in high school in an experimental program, but there was no theater department and there was no TV department in Buffalo. So 
but they had a radio station. And so I said, I'll join the radio station and see where that takes me. And they were hiring just at that time. The anti-war movement was going through Buffalo, and they wanted reporters to cover these demonstrations and things. And I had no experience at that. And they said, we'll train you. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time because the head of the radio station was a guy named Bill Seemering, who then went to Washington to start NPR. <clears throat> he created All Things Considered. He wrote their mission statement, and he said, I'm not hiring you at NPR. <clears throat> he said, I said, Good, well, it's like, get me out of Buffalo, right? It's cold. <clears throat> when I graduated in 71, he said, you're overqualified. I said, what do you mean? He said, I just hired this woman named Stamberg and somebody named <laughs> Wertheimer, and, and they, they came in these entry-level jobs, but they never stayed there. They got on the radio. And I said, I won't be on the radio, I promise you. He said, OK. So I, he, I, he hired me. There was a staff of 35 there. There are now 835 people in NPR. Um, and he introduced me to the staff, and he said, this is Ira Plato. He will never be on the radio. <laughs> I wanted to crawl under something. Three days later, I was on the radio <laughs> because the Washington senators were leaving to go to Texas, and they all knew I was a great, you know, I had reporting experience, and I was a great baseball fan, and they said, well, go out and cover this sort of thing, and I did my first story covering the uh, belated attempts that, to bring the Washington senators back, which they never did. But they, they appreciated th that science was important and they allowed me to be a science producer. And after a while, I worked myself up as a science reporter and created the science unit at NPR. If you, if you ever saw the movie uh, Broadcast News, there's a, scene, there's a scene in the movie where there's a, somebody in the control room whispering questions in the ear of the, of the interviewer who asked the questions. That was me. <laughs> I, I was assigned, because I couldn't be on the radio, to, to tell the, my boss, who used to be my colleague and he was my mentor, who was doing the interview, ask this question. Now, here's the follow-up. And if, after a while, Bill Seemering realized this was kind of crazy. So he allowed me to actually go on the radio, and I did my best to lose my New York accent as much as possible, which I have failed at miserably. So. And the rest is history. The rest is history. Well, yeah, so far. So I stayed at NPR. Um, almost 20 years, and then I, I went out and did a TV show called Newton's Apple. That was me. And that was I? I don't know. That was, so I wanted to get back into radio, and I was listening to what was popular on the radio, and talk radio had started. And I, I, I went back to NPR, my friends, and I said, I'd like to do a, you know, a science program on, on NPR. And they said, well, how would you do this? And I said, I'll put it together. And, and they said, here's the real problem, is that the stations don't have national talk shows. How are we going to convince them to have a national talk show? And Saddam Hussein bailed me out on this one, <laughs> because he started the Gulf War, and NPR started a daily talk, national talk show about what happened in the war. And that it didn't last very long, but the stations had a, ooh, they got a taste of what a talk show could be like and wanted one. So I said, remember me? I said, my idea? OK. I originally wanted it on a Thursday. They said, well, let's put it on a Friday. It's got a nicer ring to it, Science Sci Fry, Science Friday. So I said, OK. And that was in 1991. And uh, so we're in our 33rd year. And so thank you. And you know, we have a huge audience. We have, you know, Upwards of two million listeners, radio and podcast listeners, and our educational stuff. And I always believed in educational material. And early on, um, we, did, we had, back in the 90s, in the early 90s, we had the only educational material on all of NPR. Well, I wanted to ask you about education, because yeah. I've heard you say that you don't need to be a missionary for science, because everyone always loved it. But that people don't get exposed to it in ways that allow them to appreciate it and understand it. And I heard a conversation that you had on First Coast Connect, our yeah. show this morning, uh, with Ann Schindler, and she described her first uh, experience as being forced to memorize the periodic table. How, That's not, you know, to how my, can we make it better? How well, can we make science I'll tell you how better? we make it better. We don't, 
We don't try to teach kids science like they're all going to be scientists, because they're not. Maybe 1% or whatever, and you'll see outstanding kids who have a knack for it. But we should teach science like we teach music and art. We should teach you how to appreciate science. What does it do for you? Why should you learn about it? Who are the great scientists, like the great artists? What did they do? What were their contributions? Why is it important to know about science? You don't have to, know, you don't have to learn how to titrate chemistry. You, know? you don't have to roll a steel ball down to understand that, but you can understand why it's important to learn, that people learn about it and why science is important, because someday you're going to be a voter and you're going to have to vote your, you know, your money, your, your tax money to pay for science research. And so you should be able to understand it. And if you, and if, and if you, you know, you want to become a scientist, there's always that road to you. But it's important to learn why science, I think, uh, is vital to, to, you know, I mean, Benjamin Franklin, our democracy was based on scientists. Well, scientists. Sci science is in the Constitution. What else is, you know, the, 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 the patent laws are written into the Constitution as being necessary because they understood that you can't have commerce without science. You have, to make, you have to protect the science that's being done. So that's the way I think you should be teaching science, of teaching you how to appreciate it and understand what it does so in I your think, daily life. I, I think we all got kind of an appreciation and an exposure to science in an unintended way through the pandemic. I sometimes yes. think of the pandemic as a giant experiment exactly. in exposing us to the scientific process, both the process of trying to understand the virus itself and then to develop the vaccine. How do you think that experiment went and what should we learn from it? What was most interesting about that experiment is that people learned how science is done because most people think that all scientists agree with each other. In fact, the first letter I ever got when we did Science Friday those many years ago was after a debate I had about why the dinosaurs were killed. Remember that asteroid theory? That was brand new at that time. And I had scientists who were debating whether that was real or not. And a week later, a postcard came in from Barbara in New Jersey. Shocked. She was shocked. Scientists disagreeing, arguing? Doesn't science know everything? And it told me that we were success successful because we showed how, how science really works. It's disagreements among scientists. It's, it's, uh, science is just a snapshot of the knowledge we have now, and it changes as our knowledge changes and the evidence changes. And that's what happened with the COVID. Uh, COVID lessons is that the public learned that as the science changes, you have to change your opinion about how COVID works or about vaccines or about... Uh, how you do research, and that you can't be stuck in one position about what you know about, you know, medicine. I think we've all had this experience, not only through the pandemic, but through our lifetimes, of trying to understand that science changes. I mean, we all remember when cholesterol was just bad, and then, oh, wait, there was good cholesterol? What did that mean? Right? Many things that seem to change, especially in terms of what is good to eat and what is not, it right. seems, right? That's a hard one, yes. So how do we regain our trust in science when it seems like the sands are shifting underneath us? When do we know when it's right? When do you know when science is... Well, uh, there, is, <laughs> there are certain questions that science can answer and certain questions that are not scientifically answerable. In other words, if you want to know if God exists or not, science can't answer that question because God is supernatural and not part of nature. Science can only investigate what nature is. And a, a question is only valid scientifically if you can do experiments to prove or disprove it. If you can't do those experiments, and that's the kind of thing that's going on in physics now with string theory, which is a whole part of physics, String theory predicts certain things, but there's no way to test it out. So it becomes sort of a religion after a while, because you can't test out religion to see if it's true scientifically, and you may not be able to ever test string theory, so it's something you have to let go and go on to something else, even though there are people who still work on it. Uh, we have to just use, we have to just teach people or, or constantly expose people to more kinds of scientific thinking. And so people will understand that science is a process. And it's not, you know, it's not an encyclopedia 
that sits on the book, uh, on the table, you open it up and say, oh, there's the answer. You know? Well, let's talk about uh, uh, an area in science that, um, in which I think this, this is an important question, and that's the area of climate, right? It's an climate. important, it's important science-related question, um, but good, it's not good like... state to talk about climate. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's important in many ways, it's, and it's, it's difficult because right, it's not like an, ast an asteroid is out there threatening the Earth that we can all understand and react to immediately. It's kind of a slow motion problem that has been gathering pace. But it's also something in which there seems to have been a scientific consensus for some time, yes. uh, but we've been very slow to understand and accept that consensus. So we talk about understanding that science is changing and does change. How does the climate fit into that? Well, science has become politicized now. It's never used to be this political that you were identified by your politics about, I know what you believe because you're, you're, I know what party you belong to or, or who you're voting for. Um, there's no way to do, in climate change to live in Florida and not see it all around you from the flooding that goes on to the hurricane intensities to and other parts of the country are now experiencing what Florida has been. This week, San Diego had a rainstorm. In San Diego, it was 90, what they called a 90-year rainstorm. It hasn't rained like that in 90 years. Get used to that because that's, you know, the, the, the new normal. When you're, be, when you're losing all the sand on the beaches and the, 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 the king tides are coming up more, this is, this is because you're sinking into the, into the ocean. And that's because the oceans are also rising. Now, when the ice is melting in Antarctica and in, the, and, and in the Greenland, like no one has ever seen before in these giant icebergs, you can't deny what you're seeing. This is the evidence. And if you trace... The evidence, you can trace it back all the way to a certain point in the Industrial Revolution where the carbon dioxide has started increasing and there's a direct link to that. Now, if you don't want to believe that, there's nothing I can tell you or present any amount of evidence if your belief system or your political system denies that. When people ask me, what was one of the, the best shows you ever did? And it was a show that I did about many years ago about... Um, autism and vaccinations. Do you remember that time where people... Uh, well, on my show, I had the world's smartest scientist about, uh, uh, about uh, vaccinations. And he had investigated the connections and found there was no connection. He came on the program with reams of data and stuff. I had a listener call in, and for the I let her go on for eight minutes uninterrupted, giving her side of, the, of her ideas about why there is this connection, and I wanted the audience to hear, my audience to hear what this political side was, and I think it was a political side, until I asked her at the end, and I said, ma'am, um, is there any amount of data that I can give you that will change your mind? And there was a little pause, and she said, well, Ira, I just don't believe anything my government tells me. Now, you cannot, you know, I, you know, I can present you with all kinds of science, science about climate change, whatever, and if you have a political or religious belief that is going to put up a wall against understanding this, there's nothing you, we can do about that. That's why, you know, that's why when they, they poll uh, in election years, they poll the undecided, because the hardest thing to do is to change somebody's mind. I have found that. Uh, you can, you, if they have decided and, get, and made up their mind, it's very hard, very rare to get them to change their mind. So, so I want to stay with climate for a minute on a yeah. somewhat more hopeful note. You've done a lot of programs <laughs> about technologies that are either kind of being introduced or have been introduced that offer some right. promise in either mitigating climate change, reducing carbon emissions, and so forth. What do you think is most promising from all the people you've talked to? Well, there is a statistic I think that just came out about last year was the first time that the CO2 level has actually dropped a little bit. Not that we're out of the woods on this sort of thing, but it does show that if you make up your mind, your political mind and, and whatever, your monetary mind, that you can do something to affect the, you know, the future of climate change. Um, and it's, and it's something that 
affects everybody and it's, it's there and you can't deny it. It's just, it's just something that, unfortunately, we live in an age of, of when things go crazy, then we take action. Almost, you know, when we have mega incidents like a giant hurricane or an earthquake, oh, something discovers this could be climate related. So it may take a few of those for more people to understand that you know, these rising ocean levels or the, these crazy uh, hurricanes and things like that are, are linked. And my, it, might, it might, that's who we are, unless we can change, you know, leadership that comes out and, and really forcefully. So another topic that you've covered on your show quite a bit is artificial intelligence. Right. It's, you know, become a buzzword that we all have become more familiar with since the appearance of Chet GPT more than a year ago now. The pace of development is really quick. Um, there are some really promising applications. You did a program about some of the medical applications, right. mammogram uh, interpretation and complex diagnoses and so forth. Uh, there's also a lot of peril associated with it. Where are you on the promise versus peril scale? I'm leaning, when I, uh, when I did the show, it was last week on AI, and uh, in case you didn't hear it, I had a uh, a researcher named Eric Topol who follows this. He's a cardiologist and he follows this very carefully. And he, fa he has discovered during looking at various studies that, shockingly, computers are better at diagnosing imagery than doctors are. If you give uh, doctors or, or people, there are 800,000 deaths every year from misdiagnosis of people's illnesses. A lot of that happens by reading the slides the mammograms, the, 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 other, the other kind of imaging, and we, what's really good at reading these things is artificial intelligence. AI can pick up stuff that doctors miss, whether it's tumors on a bone or, or whether it's something on your lungs or some sort of diagnosis, AI is really good at it. And I really think that this is really the hopeful part of AI, is, is, is in medicine and saving a lot of people's lives and in diagnosing. And, we focused on one of, the, one of the ideas here was that your retina, I got an email, I'll tell you about this email I got. Your retina contains so much information about things that are going on in the rest of your body that AI can find this stuff, whether it's heart disease, whether it's um, Parkinson's disease, a lot of it is actually reflected in your retina because your retina is actually an extension of your brain. Your, your brain is literally just in your eyes as part of it. And uh, AI can pick up these diseases before they're ever diagnosed. And so t to me, that w that's really the hopeful part. Medicine, finding stuff before, treating it before, is really, I'm hopeful. I know you can distrust AI, and we have to be careful about it, because also, one of, the, one of the problems with AI is it's programmed by people. And people have real biases. The data they feed, you have to train the AI. You have to train it with case studies and things, what to look for, and what you decide to feed it, you can be very biased, and whether it's population studies. Um, it, it's, it's that, that's where we have to be careful about how we train, and that's one of the biggest But problems. you're an optimist. I am, I am an optimist. Both generally and on this topic. <laughs> As a journalist, I'm a cynic. But, <laughs> but I, I have to be hopeful about something, because I'm not an optimist about climate change. Um, you know, because that thing, climate change is moving so fast. I mean, the oceans are rising so quickly. The, the atmosphere is changing. You know, you, you, there are already signs that the, what we used to call the Gulf Stream, which is warms Great Britain, is changing. And if that Gulf, by the water that's draining out of Greenland, it's cooling the water and it changes the current. You know, do you ever know what latitude that, that uh, that London is on. London is on the same latitude as, as, as something like Quebec. Mm -hmm. So if you lose the warmth from that ocean, it's going to turn into Canada. And they're not quite ready for that snow yet, you know. <laughs> so um, it's, 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 I think that's, that's a bigger threat than AI is. So now. I want to ask you one other question that's related to climate, and that is about the word nuclear. Nuclear is a word that a lot of people have bad associations with. That's because they say nuclear. <laughs> that too. <laughs> but you correct them when they do that, I right? do, I yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But people have bad associations with that word because of nuclear weapons, because of reactor accidents. Right. 
But a lot of smart people and smart people on your program said, you know, if we're going to address the climate crisis, we're going to have to adopt a different attitude about nuclear energy. What do you think has to happen for that to happen? I think we have to make, and this is where the research is headed, making smaller nuclear power plants. They're now making tiny nuclear power plants that are smaller than the stage, smaller, and finding, you know, that there are safer ways to encapsulate it because you don't need this giant plant to make it. And it can be, it can be used for certain applications. For example, one that I've seen, I have seen happen, I find it exciting, is desalinating water. We are really in a water crisis around the world. And the way water, you desalinate water is one of two ways. One is you sort of flash it into steam, and, you, and now steam has got, the salt is gone. Or you put it through a reverse osmosis filter, like you might have under your sink. You know? But it takes a lot of pressure to do this, and a lot of electricity to do this. Now, there are certain countries that have said, hey, let's take a small nuclear reactor and do nothing but power the desalination plant. And so we can make it small enough that we, we can control it and be safe enough. And I'm, I'm hopful about that. Like on that submarines. Kind of, huh? Like on submarines. The yeah. reactors on submarines well, are yeah, small. Like, like on submarines. And actually, actually, the Russians have floating little nuclear power plants that are on, on little boats. And there, there are some actual successes with that. But you're right. You could take a submarine-sized one and make, it, and, 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 and make it small enough so that you have not only created a smaller version, but you've decentralized electricity. So that when you have a power grid failure here, the rest of the country doesn't, doesn't go out. And the grid really needs to be modified. And if we're going, heading toward an electric USA, which we, the whole world is heading that way, then we have to make a smart grid, and that's going to take work. So I want to ask you a couple of questions about space, another the final favorite, a favorite topic Absolutely. Uh, on Science Friday. I mean, it's a time of lots of breakthroughs in space, both in astronomic research and in space flight, although in space flight it seems like we're trying to kind of recreate a feat that we accomplished 50 years ago. Now we have these fantastic images that we're seeing from the James Webb Space Telescope, space telescope or as one of your guests recently referred to it, the Jim Webby Space Telly Webby. from Britain. I hadn't heard that I really one before, but like it's kind of cute, yeah. I mean, does it make sense to be putting our resources back into putting people in space and on the moon when we have this opportunity in unmanned space flight? Yes, it does make sense. Because I think um, I grew up as a child of the space age in, this, in the 60s watching it. And I, I think there are, there are uniting projects to do where people of, of all different beliefs about where life should go will, might think, hey, it's great to go to the moon or it's great to go to Mars and it's a great project to do and we certainly have enough resources to do it. And even though we have great robotic stuff where we're looking for, we're going to go to the moons of maybe Jupiter or Saturn and look for life in those moons because it's possible there could be there are signs of life there, of of the chemistry that we need for life. I still think that uh, people are explorers and they want to explore things. And I think that uh, there's no reason we certainly, you know, we're not the only game in town anymore. Back in the 60s, the US and the Soviets were in a race. Who would, now the Chinese are, going to, are on the moon, the Japanese or the, the Israelis tried to go there. A lot of people are now doing it. If we don't do it, Someone else is going to do it, and if the government does it, you know, Elon Musk or somebody else will come out or come along and do something privately. But I just think we we a lot of people think we're not alone. We want to search for life. Well, I've got to ask you this because again, it's a, it's a subject that comes up on the program. Yes. Where are you on that? On the the possibility of intelligent life elsewhere in the universe? If you just do the math, right? Which is the math. You know, the old Frank Drake equation, which has been updated. There's so many trillions and billions of stars out there, so many billions of our, just in our own galaxy, that the odds that there's no, there's no other life out there is just astronomical, so to speak, that it doesn't exist. Um, and right here in our own solar system, we discovered life probably on our Earth, or probably originated not on the surface of the planet, but way down in the oceans below where we have these sorts of, these have these geothermal vents, this hot water is coming up, and there are 
creatures living around there that defy your imagination, and they are so hardy uh, that, that they might be things that are living on other planets because their other planets have oceans on them, salty oceans, and they might have the kind of heat that's down there that would be okay for the chemical genesis of life. So I would be surprised if we don't find so something. So you say yes. Yes. I'd be surprised okay. if we don't find something even I'm in our solar system. glad we've gotten you on the record on that. So, you're not the first one. So. <laughs> I want to talk about a couple of um, advances in medicine. Again, the subject which comes up often on Science Friday. The World Obesity Federation, which I have to admit is an organization that I didn't know existed until I started researching for this talk, says that more than half of the world is going to be overweight or obese by 2035. But we now have a real breakthrough in weight loss drugs that seem to be effective uh, for as long as people take them, but they're extremely expensive, which means that I'm access shocked, to them shocked is that limited. Extremely <laughs> shocked. Well, that's, that's the question I want to ask you. I mean, the, the drug development process appears to work in that it leads to breakthroughs on a, a, a pretty consistent basis. You know, what it doesn't, you know what it doesn't lead to? A cure. Drug companies will make a lot of drugs and a lot of money because they don't want to lose a customer. They want to treat you for your whole life. They don't want to cure you. They want to treat you so that they, they can make oodles and oodles of money on people being sick. And I've talked about this for decades, ever since I was started out as a reporter 50 years ago, and I used to hang out with medical reporters, they say, you gotta keep an eye on the drug companies because this is what they do, is their stock price is what's really important. And I'm, I'm looking, and I talk to researchers who will tell me, you know, if the drug companies invested in this line of research, specifically, we've actually talked about this on the radio, they could find a cure for these illnesses, but they don't want to do that because they don't want to find a cure for this stuff. Because there's no money in finding a cure for this stuff. So you can have obesity drugs and whatever, you're not going to find a cure for obesity because no one wants to cure obesity. They want, you, they want to treat you for it. So, you know, it's not politically correct to talk about this, but it is absolutely vital that we understand what the business model of this is. So. Your next yeah. question was? <laughs> right. Now that I you know think, where I'm I think coming, asked you didn't have to ask me that one. I volunteered that one. <laughs> so another breakthrough in medicine has been around the CRISPR edit yes. gene editing process yes. with a treatment for sickle cell disease. Right. Do you think that we're kind of at the tip of the iceberg on yes. CRISPR? CRISPR at the tip of the iceberg. It's, it's a question of how to, best, how to identify the first cases to use it on. Because you, you like, it, like with sickle cell, you're looking for simple gene manipulation. Diseases that, that we know are caused by one gene, if we fix it, one or two genes, we, we can have a cure for that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm a great believer. I think, I think diabetes is going to be cured one of these days, if the drug companies ever want to cure something. Talk about an industry. Um, and, you know, for example, we do a lot of mouse studies. Yeah, we always talk about mouse studies and rat studies. We have cured cancer in mice a million times. We've cured diabetes in mice a million times. You talk to scientists who work on this. It's a question of transferring it over to people. And it's very difficult sometimes because mice and people are, don't have exactly the same systems, but they have similar systems. And um, CRISPR will allow us I think, to, to, uh, to identify more of these genetic illnesses um, and then how to, how to give it to people at a reason. You know what it costs, this, this new treatment for sickle cell? I do not. You know, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars a person it would cost to treat these people. So who's going to get it? You know, who's going to be able to afford that kind of stuff? So, you know, many of these breakthroughs that we've just been talking about, um, including new drugs, are actually built on the top of basic research, basic science that is largely, largely publicly funded. Absolutely. Do you think the public understands that? No. Most of, this ba most of basic research, medical basic research, comes from the National Institutes of Health, which funds a lot of basic stuff. They, they, do, this, they do this spade work. They do this spade work for, for the drugs, finding out how the disease actually operates. 
And then when it comes to a point where they understand it enough, drug company will come along and then try to and create the drugs to, to treat those, those diseases. Did they ever pay back the NIH for the... I haven't ever heard of Maybe a couple of cases that I don't know about, but I've never heard that, you know, I never heard a drug company hold a press conference and say, hey, look, here's the check, we're paying back your tax money that we used your basic research for. But thank goodness for the NIH being able to do that um, and also being able to work on orphan drugs. They never used to. Back when I started, there used to be these, these illnesses called orphan drugs, orphan diseases, I'm sorry, that only affect a million people. Only a million people. There's no money to be made in only a million people. So the drug companies didn't work on them until the Congress came in and gave a special compensation to work on orphan drugs so it would be profitable for them to do that. Um, but uh, yes, I would like to, you know, I'd like to see some sort of recognition that your tax money is, and, and you, you don't know it because you don't hear very much about it, uh, your tax money is being used in basic research. And basic research is absolutely vital because sometimes we don't know where it goes, where, what's going to be the outcome, Could, because people, people hate failure. Failure, no one remembers who lost the Super Bowl or cares about who lost the Super Bowl, right? We only know the winners. And, but science is built on the shoulders of failure. Failure is absolutely necessary for science to progress. And so we won't hear, any, you know, we won't hear about the, we'll hear about the failures when the government gives somebody a grant and, oh, they, they failed. And we'll hear politicians say, hey, look, you know, they failed with this stuff. Why aren't we spending money on it? People have to understand the value of failure very important. And that's what we have to teach our kids. When we teach them science, we have to teach them you're going to fail more than you're going to succeed. You're going to be like the sculptor. You have to chip away at the failures in that block until the head pops out. It's all that stuff that doesn't belong there. It doesn't work. You have to get past that, and then you'll see the fruits of what you're working on. But that's the kind of thing. Since we only teach about you have to be the best and successful and whatever, and don't, don't fail, that's something I think we have to change. So I'm going to ask one more question, and then we're going to turn to your questions. You recently did kind of a two-part thing on the Endangered Species Act, and right. I was really interested to learn that 99% of the species that have been identified through the Endangered Species Act are actually still among us. So it seems like that has been successful. The other thing that I thought was interesting is that this seems like an act that is built on the work of people as much as it is the work of government in that anyone can actually suggest that a species be identified under the act. Yeah. And a lot of the work that goes into preserving species is actually done by Us. citizens on the Us. ground right. uh, doing all kinds of things that actually uh, help to mitigate against the, the forces that are, that are causing that uh, species to be in danger. You know, there was a thing that had a lot of currency, it seems to me, a, a few years ago, citizen science. And I wonder if you would talk a little bit about that and what that means yeah. and, and how people are right. participating in big science projects all over the world. We're, we're very much in Science Friday interested in citizen science and at times we will create a citizen science project to get the citizens, citizens involved. In, I remember this, this goes way back. I remember, in, especially in education, I remember back in the, in the 80s being part of a school plan to teach, how do you teach kids how to do science? The way we teach kids how to do science in the old days is we created these chemistry experiments like Mr. Wizard, you pour two liquids together, a volcano comes out, or suddenly you go to the science museum and you put two liquids together and it turns yellow, then green, then orange, and that's supposedly science. That's not science. Science is actually citizen science. It is going out and collecting the data. Richard Feynman, the famous physicist, said, I, when he was asked, how do you do science, what is the definition? You come up with an idea, and you collect the data to prove it or disprove it. And citizen science can be something as simple as, and I remember being a part of these experiments, how do we get kids involved in being citizen scientists? Everybody has a pond near them, or a standing water. Go out and take the pH reading, the acidity reading at the pond, and send it in to us. And they created a national, we, we discovered what acid rain was. We discovered where it was by the pH that all these kids and all these families did 
collecting it together, and they actually created a map of what acidic, well, where the acidic parts were. So it's, it's, it's not only an educational way of teaching what science really does, which is collect data, but it's also a way of getting families involved with their kids and teaching people what science is all about, because people don't, you know, they don't know how science is done, they don't know how, how important data is, and, you know, back in the day when everybody didn't have their own facts, your facts and my facts. <laughs> when we could all agree on the data, pe people were actually able to, you know, go out and collect this sort of data, which is still going on today, and we try to encourage that with citizen science projects. And we'll hook up with other citizen science projects that are going on uh, that we're not involved with, but we'll give some notice to and let people get involved. You know, it could be the eclipse, which is coming up in April. Hope you all go see it. You know, the, even scientists are very excited about that because even though they've seen lots of eclipses, they want to go out and collect some more data. So maybe they can, they can get citizens involved in looking at it and telling them what they see around the world in different places, and they can take all the data and combine it. So. Let's turn to some questions from the audience. I think we're going to, uh, yes, we've got one up front here, so we're going to get a mic to you as quickly as we can. I was wondering what your oh. sorry. I was wondering what your idea sorry. <laughs> um I was wondering what your ideas and viewpoints on like preserving indigenous bug species to help with climate climate change, environmental health and um like saving ecosystems. Yes, we, yes a very good, it's a good question. How do we preserve natural species of bugs, but not only of bugs, what about plants, right? What about food, cereal, food cereals and things? There are actually banks, seed banks, and places where people collect this data, and I think there's one up in Norway or someplace really cold to keep, to keep them preserved for as long as they need to, but it's very important because we're losing so many of these species um, as, as climate change happens, and the species are moving, you know, whole tree populations, the Vermont syrup trees are moving to Canada, you know, because it's not cold enough in Vermont anymore. So, besides the tourists moving somewhere else, but they, you know, yeah, that's an, important, that's an important point. Hi, uh, thanks for uh, visiting us. Uh, I, I want to, uh, your opinion or tips, I just now talked about citizen science. I was not aware of that. Uh, there are many, I would say, I'm just going to use this word, soccer moms, um, who actually do go and, uh, you know, train kids, um, elementary school, middle school, high school. But somehow they do not uh, have that kind of training to actually have a scientific outlook. Um, is there some tips or uh, some some help we can give? Uh, yes. Where these? I mean, they are, they may been you know, the city spends one billion dollars on a stadium, but there's nothing spent on science. So yeah, we, we don't. I, I I think I get the gist of you. How does a soccer mom know how to collect science stuff? And you just tell them. I mean, collecting samples. You know, you might be able to help them find sterile containers to put things in, or if you really have a, a, a good net project, you can supply the kinds of things they need, and it's, it's not difficult to be able to take a drop of water and stick it in a, you know, a, a, a sterile little test tube and send it back someplace with the date and time collection, things like that. But yeah, it's even soccer moms. Okay, I think we've got that. one over there. This one over here too. You are such a good interviewer. I wondered what resources do you use to keep ahead in the science world? What do you read? What do you listen to? Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a 24/7 job. In other words, I'm constantly I'm I'm just curious as I was a, as a kid. I was on, I never outgrew this curiosity about how the world works. So I'm constantly now online looking at science stories. I get, I get 100, 100 emails a day just about science leads from people who send ideas or, or research papers or journals and things like that. 
and I, I read them all, um, looking for little stuff, and I'm looking for that aha moment that goes off in my head, the light bulb that will go off, saying that this is something I want to look into. But I just was always curious about this stuff, you know? And, and I used to read, as a kid, I used to read science news and things like that. There used to be, the back page had a things of science side where you could send away for little science kits and things like that, shells or whatever. And, I used to, and my parents, again, having a mentor, they were very much in favor of me doing this sort of stuff. Um, but I just, you know, I don't, the clock doesn't go off at 4 o'clock on Friday and say, I'm done, you know, because I'm constantly reading this stuff because I really want to know just because it's fun to know things. You know, people get satisfaction as, as being lifelong learners, like my audience is. They want to know all this stuff. And so they, I don't, they, they, their clock doesn't go off at 4 in an afternoon on Friday, and, and mine, mine doesn't either. So I'm constantly trying to figure out how to stop doing this sort of thing. One in the back. Hello. Hi, Ira. Big fan. <laughs> um, earlier you had mentioned that there's really not much you could do for people that have either, you know, political or religiously held beliefs. But I was curious to know if you want people that have maybe anecdotal based beliefs into the same category. And if not, um, are there any approaches that you have found particularly effective for helping sort of tease apart that deep emotional resonance of personal experiences uh, from science-based evidence? Thanks. I'm not quite sure I understood, but I... I think, I think I'll try to paraphrase the question for a minute. I think yeah. the question is, there are people who don't believe in science for right. a variety of reasons, but there are other people who maybe have an anecdotal experience right. that causes them to believe one thing, which is maybe counterfactual or, right. or not true. Right. How, how can you convince right. people to accept something that runs counter to their own personal experience? That's a good, good question, because you have to understand that science is not about anecdotal experience. The science, anecdotal experience is, could set off a question of science, and you see it and you say, hey, let's, let's investigate why we don't fall off the earth as we keep having ships go over the horizon. <laughs> doesn't happen. Why is that, you know? Well, then you, then you create a systematic way of collecting data to prove or disprove that. So if somebody has, and this is how science works, you know, scientists always come up with anecdotal ideas about how things work, but you have to go out and collect the evidence. So you have to tell people, that's a, nice, that's a nice theory about something, but until we can collect enough evidence and convince enough scientists that this is not gonna change the way we believe how the world works. Great, one over here. Ira, as you know, my son asked to, for us to get a picture together, and I was wondering, as you look for citizen, citizen scientists, right, have, and please don't laugh, but have you ever considered doing uh, research via TikTok, uh, via hashtag, and doing a certain like numerical number that says, hey, I want to gather data on this, and because that's where the younger kids are at. And for, I was so proud of him at 16 to say, hey, mom, get a picture. But these kids are willing to, yeah. they're willing to participate, and that's where they live. Granted, not all of right. them, right. but anyway. That's a good question because we are on TikTok and we are on Instagram and we have been leaders in, uh, we were the first show to be on uh, not just Facebook, but we were the first show to do uh, a podcast. I mean, we're on record as being the first people to actually use the word podcast on a broadcast radio station network. <laughs> um, so we're always looking absolutely with younger audiences in mind, and we have a whole division, we have a whole audience section of our show that's not part of the radio show that looks to get kids and other, other kids involved in uh, doing stuff that we're doing. So yeah, we're, we're aware of that, and it's a, it's a challenge to Over figure here. out where the next is gonna be. Um, first, I, I want to thank you for being Ira Flato. Thank my mother, or father. <laughs> thank, thank you. And actually, the second thing I was to thank you for was for your parents, but you took care of that. Do you feel that there is a correlation 
between the rise of obesity and the emergence of ultra-processed. Say again, I'm sorry. There's Do you conflict? feel that there is a correlation yeah. between the rise of obesity oh. and the emergence of ultra-processed foods? Well, there seems to be uh, certainly evidence for that. You know, nutrition, obesity, how that happens, what happens is, 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 is in rapid flux all the time. But yes, there, if, if you look at data, they will correlate, you know, ultra-processed food with the rise of obesity, but you might find other things that correlate with it as well. So I, I'm not ready to say that that is the cause, because there's so many other causes of obesity that, you know, genetics, whatever, that kind of thing that uh, it might be one of, the, one of the factors. Ira, I'm a car nut, and my question is, what is the sustainability of electric vehicles? Can our infrastructure handle them? Can we reproduce them sufficiently? Do we have the power to plug them in? And when we have to dispose of all of that stuff in them, uh, can the world survive those heavy metals? Uh, I do car reviews. I test electric cars. I love them. But Earhead buddies of mine say, not a chance, you'll, you'll find me buried in one, but never driving one. Wow, what a question. <laughs> because it has so many different questions in it. How do I answer? Let me go backwards and just say I've driven a Tesla for six years. So I have a lot of experience with an electric car and what it does, what it can, and what its limitations are. Um, we are moving, I don't think heavy metals are going to be, you know, the research into battery technology is, is moving very rapidly, a lot of different kinds of things uh, that will be possible to use as, as battery material may not be, uh, you know, the kinds, of, the kinds of materials, lithium, whatever we use today, may, five years from now, may not be the forefront of where electric cars are. Do we, need, do we need to create a new charging system? Is there enough electricity around? There is if we know how to use it correctly. You know, if we know how to make it, if we, if we know how to uh, take hydrogen out of the water, using, you know, that kind of thing. It's there, it just needs a cohesive program. You know, like Finland, one in four cars in Finland, I remember the story, there was this crazy story this week about cars in Chicago that were freezing over, electric cars. Obviously, these people never drove an electric car before because they, they allow that to happen to your car, you have no experience with it. We all, all of us who drive electric cars know about the shortened range and the freezing weather and whatever. And what you didn't see, I got to, I have to do my journalism rant on this for a second. <laughs> it was an awful story the way it was covered because it was one, even if it's true about that charging station, that's one charging station in 30,000. What about going to another one and see if they had the same problem? Or two or three of them, let's make N greater than one, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. I was just livid at this. Not only that, it shows the rapid rise in, in electric cars is outpacing people's knowledge about how to use them correctly. The reason you see these crashes happening in these electric cars is people are not driving them like they were told to, to drive them. I mean, if you look at per million miles accidents, well, let's say a Tesla versus a gas car, there are four times more accidents in a gas car and then there are in, in a Tesla, in electric cars. Four times, because believe it or not, a computer is better at driving than you are. <laughs> Just like a computer is better at analyzing maybe data on a, a mammogram, it's better at doing certain stuff than people are. But I think, getting back to your question directly, I think, yeah, you know, we are, it's inevitable this is gonna happen. We are heading toward an electric society, it's gonna happen, we will, you know, we all, your car, my car, it's all gonna be, plugged in as part of a system where my solar panels now already, I live in New England and Connecticut, already feed Massachusetts and, and Rhode Island when there's an outage. They buy my electricity from my battery and my solar panel, and they pay me at the end of the year. So not only, not only, and do this in California and other places, so all our cars hooked together are going to be a giant battery that's on the grid. And the car and the batteries that run are, are helping our solar panels. That's we're all going to share this electricity. It just takes time to learn how you know how to use a gas engine versus a buggy whip. And it's just a, it's a it's a learning curve. Over here. Hello. Two days ago, I drove across the Florida board, Georgia border 
just a few miles to a place called the Neutral Zone where they film Star Trek Continues, Extra Voyages, because they didn't finish that five-year mission, you know. And while I was there, I met Chris Dewan, who is the son of James Dewan, of Scotty, of the Beam Me Up Scotty. And I asked him, so I've heard that your dad's remains have been shot up in a rocket? And he said, yeah, they're on the space station right now. And I said, well, didn't we just hear that the space station's going to be <laughs> in about a decade? So what's going to happen with his remains? He's like, I don't know. And then, of course, that makes you think about other things on the space station. So, you know, what do we know? Well, they're using the space station, as we do for a lot of things, to make money. So if you want to put something, you want to fly something, and you want to pay for what thousands of dollars per kilogram to put your stuff on the space station, uh, that's what they'll, they'll use it for. And, they'll, and I imagine they'll, you know, they'll do a lot of other things to make money in space, put stuff on the moon, put your ashes on the moon, move, put it into orbit, uh, those kinds of things. They're, they're all money-making things. So we're going to see, as, as private industry, you know, which is what it's made to do is to make money, as we'll find ways of making money even in space. So, you know, that's, that's how it works. In the back there. Okay, I'm, I've been given a, an, an opportunity, I feel compelled to ask on behalf of my sister, um, who's not here tonight. She's a, a really big Aliens fan. She's a nut. And I don't know if you were following the David Grush congressional hearings, the uh, intelligence officer, who doesn't say that he saw anything, but says that he has talked to people who've seen things. <laughs> and so he, um, I don't know, uh, AOC was part of it, Matt Gates. Um, it was a bipartisan uh, congressional hearing. Did you, did you hear anything about that? Are you following any of it? I, I follow the hearings. We actually did a show on this uh, by, with an author a couple of weeks ago about aliens and outer space and what it would, what it would take. And uh, the science so, so far as he used to like to quote Carl Sagan, extraordinary claims requires extraordinary evidence if you want to prove something like that. But what I found more interesting about whether, his point was about whether we have, aliens have visited us or not, is that we are now at a point where we can see if aliens live on other worlds. I mean, we have these, we have these exoplanets. An exoplanet is a planet that lives outside of our solar system light years away, but our technology is good enough now to actually look at the, at the solar system of these other planets and at the planets themselves, and look at the atmosphere. I mean, if you were out there and looked at Earth, or you actually would look inside our solar system, you would look for the signs that things were alive. Does it breathe? You know, is there air? What's the composition of the atmosphere made of? Is there oxygen there? Is there methane? What the signs of life that living things make? And he, his point was we should be spending more attention on finding the aliens out there, then looking for them here, because it's probably more, a more fruitful effort to do that than to look for them here. And I'm not saying they're, I'm not, I'm agnostic on any of this stuff. I don't ever, you know, I've seen enough weird things in science in my experience. I'm not willing ever to say that aliens are not here or have not ever been here, but you need evidence, really good evidence to prove that they are here or they're out there. And I, I, I will give airtime to someone who comes on with good evidence, hopeful evidence, but it has to be some pretty good evidence, like I did when cold fusion came around. And there were really good size scientists working at some of the top universities in the world doing experiments in cold fusion and getting positive results, and I gave them airtime, you know. As I did, I gave some airtime, I remember, to a conference at MIT about people who were abducted, claiming they were abducted. And I don't spend a lot of time on it, but our audience is interested in discussing these things because we are sort of a like-minded audience, like to talk about science fiction and the possibility that science fiction may be real. And so let's, let's talk about it as a topic of discussion. So, I'm, you know, I will, I will talk about things that people think I'm crazy to talk about sometimes <laughs> because... I don't, what we do on Science Friday is not an interview show, it's a discussion show. 
And when I have guests that come on and I talk, to, I talk with them, I'm saying, you know, we may go veering off to, to the side about something else that you bring up, but if it gets too far out, I'll reel it back in. But we want to have a discussion like we're sitting around your coffee table or having a beer someplace. So there's, no, there's nothing out of bounds there when you discuss those kinds of things. I'll take a couple but, of more. But, uh, Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Every Friday when I listen to your show, I hear something that makes me go, wow, that's so cool. I wonder, what boggles your mind? Wow, how do I limit that? Um, <laughs> but thank you, first of all, then, then we're doing our job right if you say that, because that's the kind of my, my, my aim when I started in this business was to create something you'll say at the dinner table, guess what I heard on the radio today? Then I know that you've had that light bulb moment. What I, what I love to talk about is stuff we don't know. And most of the stuff that we don't know is we don't know what 96% of the universe is made out of. I mean, how do you know about anything if you don't know what 96% of the universe is made out of? And specifically, it's dark energy and dark matter, which we have recently, we knew about the the uh, dark matter longer than we've known about the dark energy. We discovered that relatively recently within the last few decades. And having scientists come on to tell you, well, I don't know what that is, or this is what it could be and whatever, that means, that means there's all this physics that hasn't been discovered yet to try to explain this. And that means we have hardly scratched the surface of finding out what that stuff is. So that's what, I look up at the sky at night and say, look, everything we see it's only 4% of the universe. Anything that we can actually see is only 4%. And that blows, that blows my mind. And, and I like it when a scientist will come on, peripherally speaking about this, and, and I've had this, I actually took this piece of tape out and I kept it. I remember talking about this issue with a scientist who was studying something like this, dark energy, dark matter, and I said to him, so what practical value does this have? A little pause, and he said, Absolutely nothing. <laughs> I said, thank you. You know, you've made my job here. This is, you know, what's the... I, I was on the, the Big Bang Theory a few times, and the last, the last time I was on there, thank you, last time I was on there, the, the writers write really heavy-duty science into some of these episodes that goes way over the head of a lot of the people watching it, but they take the chance that there'll be enough people who understand what they were talking about. And then the last episode that I was on there was talking about this, that uh, the science, well, I can't remember what, it wasn't Sheldon, it was the, uh, Leonard. Leonard had come up against a problem at Caltech where his research has run into a dead wall and is he going to be funded anymore? Which is a big stuff that scientists really talk about. The public couldn't care less. They want to see what's going on in, you know, in the kitchen there. But the other people who are interested in this, the writers, and at the end of the show, they ended the show at the grave of Richard Feynman, quoting Richard Feynman, who said, we do science not because it goes anywhere, but we do science for the sake of science. And that was, and that was their coda that they put at the end of the show for people who wanted to understand why, you know, science leads to dead ends and how science for the sake of science someday might help. So that's what I like to One talk more. about. Hi. Hi, good evening, um, uh, Mr. Flato. It's a pleasure to hear the voice behind, or see the face behind the voice we, we hear every Friday. Uh, quick question. I grew up in the 80s where we had Mr. Wizard, where uh, he would do something, and, and us 80s kids would be like, wow, and they, we wouldn't ask why, wow, but it would just happen. And that continued through the 90s, and then the pandemic happened. And unfortunately, a political party, which I'm not going to get political, but a political party pushed against science and questioned science and sort of villainized science, like how they're treating Dr. Fauci right now. As a scientist, I'm curious, how do you see the role as a scientist going to uh, continue to happen in our country? And do you personally feel attacked, pushed against, questioned, or ridiculed for being a science post-pandemic? Well, I, I'm not a scientist, and I don't even play one on the radio. So just <laughs> let's, let's get that straight. Do I feel, I don't feel, no, I, do I feel an obligation to talk about science? Yes. Do I feel that it's important that we talk about it? Yes. I also feel that scientists should be more vocal in support of what they do. You know, I grew up, 
I'm, I'm, a, I'm a child of the 60s where we had scientists like Barry Commoner, who ran for president in the environmental movement, and Paul Ehrlich, and these people used to go on The Tonight Show along with Carl Sagan, and they were very visible and vocal about the importance of science. And I don't see enough of that going on now because what happens is that scientists, serious scientists who do that, get cast by their own other scientists as giving up on science. You know, oh, well, you're no longer a scientist because you're on, talking on the radio or you're on television or something. Your work doesn't mean much anymore. And we need more scientists who are not afraid to face those slings and arrows and talk about the importance of science, whether it is climate change, which is, we need to talk about more, or any other kinds of scientific issues. I'm always looking, you know, for scientists who are... And I had scientists on this show. I've had scientists who've chained themselves to doors of institutions to get, you know, to, to get their message out. And so if we get more scientists who can feel comfortable with being scientists and also you know, defending science, I think, especially in this political season, and have more people back them up, I think that's the kind of stuff we, we could use. So, Ira, you have, you've David. worked in public media for a long time. You've also worked in commercial media, CBS and CNBC and others. How is public media different, and why is it valuable? Good question. Um, let me see if I can attack this from a certain angle. Um, public media will support stuff that corporations may not want to support for a while. Public media, and you folks who support public media, understand that to do science, the basic science is important because it's basically important for the country, for our society. Businesses need a, an excuse to make money for supporting something. They need an audience. They need, they need somebody to buy a product. They need some sort of justifi monetary justification. Well, you know what? That doesn't that doesn't help a lot of times when we're talking about science. Doesn't help when we're, look at, look at the podcast industry, for example. Podcast industry is, is a, was a bubble that's now being burst a little bit because podcasts are dying because the businesses realize they're not getting the return they need on this to make it worthwhile. Well, in public broadcasting, people who support public broadcasting don't need that giant return. They just need to interest people and that's why it's important that people su support it like I do, like you do, um, a a as opposed to the commercial interest. Jeff, did you have? One more question. Okay. Um, what should kids like me be trying to learn about now for the future? What you should be learning about now. For now, the oh, learn how to think critically. In other words, you know, that's the problem. The problem with science is we call it science. We should, we should call it critical thinking because it's basically the same thing. Learn how to listen to what somebody is saying or what you read online and question it. You should question everything that, you know, that is of interest to you and find the evidence that would support what they're talking about. And whether that evidence comes from people who know what they're talking about or whether it comes from someone who's just doing some wacky podcast to get clickbait, you know. So critical thinking. You learn that and it will, you learn critical thinking, it'll serve you the rest of your life, especially outside of science, you know, even when you're trying to figure out what kind of insurance you need. To. <laughs> so with that, I want to extend again a thank you to our sponsors for this evening, Med Evidence and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations, and to all of you for being here this evening. Thank you. And for your support. You have some surveys. You have some surveys on your seats or on your tables, and I ask you to fill those out before you leave so that we can continue to make these events better. And I want to, of course, reserve my special thanks for Ira Flato. Ira, thank you so much thank for you. being here in Jacksonville well, and for all that you do. I want, to, I, want to say, I want to thank David for inviting us and thank you all for coming. 
Because when you show up, the 300 people show up in an event like this, you demonstrate how important what these people do at public radio do, and I applaud you and support your efforts to keep them going with your donations. It's very, very important that you do that. Thanks very much. You're welcome.